So, my name's John Cook. So, yeah, um, I'm a, currently a professor of um, learning innovation. Before that, I was a professor of education. Before that, a professor of technology enhanced learning. Um, you know, it goes back. If you go back far enough, you'll find I was in uh, indie bands. I'm a musician. On, I played in pop bands, and I currently play double bass. I started a degree in computer science. Got, went all the way to PhD, did artificial intelligence, education and music, got my interests in, but I'm now, I went through education, so you can't pin me down, try if you want to, you know. Uh, I'm based at the UE Bristol, which is the University of the West of England, in the Centre for Moving Images Research. We were just talking with colleagues about the fancy footwork, footwork you have to do as, a, as an academic in the current uh, higher education scene uh, in the UK and, and in Europe. So. Uh, that's one for a glass of wine later this evening, because I'll be, I'll be joining you for dinner. If I'm still invited after this talk. Uh, uh, <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, in Consense here, we were working on mobile learning. We did some really interesting stuff together with colleagues from... Uh, and uh, so, I'm going to use... Because uh, th things can work... Uh, responsive web browsers can work on mobile phones. It's quite a general term now, but it's the actual... What we, the way we think when we look at mobile learning is quite important. So there's, there's, oh, so my slides, let me get this uh, lightsaber working uh, there. There, if you, if you um, Google uh, on SlideShare, John Cook, West of England, you'll get the slides, they're up there now. So, so uh, but, but do take notes. I find notes keep me awake. Uh, okay, so there's a structure. It's always good to have structure. Um, um, and I'll give you an introduction more about who I am now, because if, you know, as I gave you a potted history, it would take quite a long time to go into uh, all the things I do. So, I'm from the University of West of England. We've just, I'm, I'm based in what's called the city campus. Have, has anyone ever been to Bristol? This is, this is the advert. It's a beautiful place. It's a harbour side. It's, it's got trade. It's got a port, a floating harbour. It is based on the slave trade, but, so it's got some quite magnificent buildings with a dodgy past. But uh, this is a, 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 red, a listed art gallery called the Arnold Feeney, which, so the, my university has spent £35 million uh, developing what's called the city campus. We've got other campuses, and we bought, we bought the Arnold Feeney, which is a, an art gallery, it, uh, sort of sublet it back to... Um, to the art gallery and my office and um, the university's got offices there and students so we're, um, my office is there overlooking the harbour so it's quite I've got I watch from my desk a sailing ship with you know masts and things like that so it's very nice we've got so I'm in the centre for moving images is very eclectic um, we have students from graphics design arts drawings print so it's quite that's where I am because I'm in the faculty of art creative industries and uh, education these are the areas we look at in my centre, uh, uh, but the, the one I'm, I'm, I'm in charge of is hybrid reality and culture. You've got to stick culture in there because I'm working with people from uh, the, an arts and humanities background, but culture is quite interesting. I've always looked at uh, cultural historical activity theory from an educational perspective. Those of you who know that background can, it comes from Vygotsky, uh, you know, the psychologist in the 1930s. So, so culture is quite an important word, and, but it's a very broad term. So, that's me, briefly, uh, who I am and where I'm currently living. Um, I suppose in a nutshell, you could say I'm an academic, a father, and I like to play double bass. So, that would have been, that would have been much quicker, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, could, we could have got onto the meet. But, so, this is, the, this is part two. So, we're doing quite well already. I'm, I'm, I'm doing well. Keep, keep nodding. This is your stuff, so I don't have to... Um, uh, and, as we were just discussing, I, I'm interested in the research focus on identifying transitions. They are important. So what we've got is, in terms of transitions, you're going across context, whatever. Context is another contested term, but you're taking your mobile phones, all your devices, your wearables, uh, across your, your individual space, your pri you know, private space into work, into study as a lifelong learner. So those, those transitions are very difficult to cope with. And you, but, uh, and you see, I've got more to say this of what you do within each space and across spaces. I've got, uh, I've, I've got um, something to say about this. But so I was pleased to see this, and also the idea that you, you, how technology of different types supports this. Okay, so that's very interesting to me. Has been for years. So that's all good. <coughs> so just there's a book chapter there. So if you get the slides, it's coming out in. Um, if you ever saw. 
it, the first edition by Carol Hawthornthway, it was had everyone. It's, this edition's got George Siemens in, people like that, and Mike Sharples, and I've gonna, done a chapter on, would you believe, lifelong learning. So it was a great pleasure for me to do to be invited to do that with uh, the second edition. I, I think it was. Um, uh, is so that there's a the, that link will get you to the chapter where I look at the policy, the the, fr the kind of the, it's a contested area, lifelong learning, and I'll just briefly touch on what I think it means, and then get into uh, looking at some tools I've developed in a project called Le Learning Layers, which is a Framework Seven project in its its uh, final years. That's roughly what I'm going to do. So there's access to the the chapter. <coughs> As, I, as I've alluded to, there are all sorts of debates. Lifelong learning is sometimes used as a shorthand for the knowledge economy, getting people back to work. But it's also used in different areas. Uh, I kind of unpack that, but I think it's very linked to learning transitions. Uh, I think it's like when you look at it from the uh, agency of the, the person who's doing those transitions. But it can come down as a policy directive from the uh, European Commission, UNESCO, or, U or governments, in my case, UK Gov. Um, in the chapter, so this is the, the small print, there's going to be some pictures later on, but Smith, some, a guy called Smith draws on the work of, uh, of Fields to provide us with the following three reasons why we should, con despite all the problems of it being now, it's been hijacked, we've got, these, we've got these things. It's important to retain the aspiration of having ability to have a life course of learning, giving people like that access. So there's an equ equity of access issue there, which is important. Uh, Something's new is happening, and this was a few years that he wrote it, but it's, we can always say that as the people uh, building, I build socio-technical systems, you, um, you want to say something new is happening, but it, it really is, it's become quite empowering. Uh, let me think, uh, in the UK, about one and a half million people access Facebook through mobile phones. That's why their profits in the UK and worldwide have gone up, because they've worked out how to do advertising through Facebook, and they're making year, quarter on quarter profits. So mobile phones are allowing things to happen that, that people, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of penetration is huge. Who's got the most current figures of the number of people with mobile phone services across the world? It's more or less the whole population, but, you know, and it's leapfrogged over uh, landlines in Africa, sub-Saharan deserts and things, because it's easier to put up a mast than it is to do to drill under the de desert and things like that. Uh, have you had a talk on this? No, we've had it, in, we've had it in the newspaper. Yeah, go on, let's see. Yeah. Uh, feel, feel free to butt in as well, because I, I, I love losing the plot. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll just jump to the conclusions, which there aren't any. We got this picture too. It's from yesterday. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Must take a photo of that. So you can see that some guys in in the river putting up a are doing a selfie in the middle of where is this? It's um, somewhere in Africa. Yeah. yeah. I must I must have a look at that later. Somewhere in Africa, Africa. They look happy. Yeah. <laughs> We're in the water here. This weather's like the UK. I I feel right at home here. Yeah. Also, lifelong learning is a mechanism for exclusion and control, and this is the issue uh, that I'm in, uh, so interested in. It's not easy to research sometimes. Uh, there's the kind of what you're getting is the individualization that goes on in the knowledge-based economy. These are the words you get thrown at you, and they're often uh, a, a disguised way of saying, um, you know, you're a cog in the wheel for the knowledge economy, for the good of, uh, you know, production. But we'll go into that. What? job seekers are feeling, what the market's doing, which I believe is a core uh, aspect of this, this whole uh, Marie Curie uh, uh, um, programme. So what UNESCO are saying about ICT and lifelong learning, they say it's very important. So it's good to take UNESCO's view, because um, the E stands for education. Uh, there's a risk of advanced these people being left behind, may lead to exclusion of large numbers of people <coughs> sharing uh, the advantages. So there's concern to enable all people in the world to make use of the huge potential of ICT's learning empowerment. empowerment. So there's, there's links here. So there's concerns. There's obvious opportunities, but you can't be, uh, you can't wear what we call rose-tinted glasses. You know, you've got to be uh, aware of the issues that are. Uh, so this is all explored in the book. In the if anybody's interested in that, go download the chapter, uh, which is coming out in June, I think, the book. But you've got the, my, I believe. Uh, my librarians tell me I'm allowed to say it's the author's final draft and then you, you, you get away with the copyright issue. No one sued me yet. Okay, so what, as, as you may imagine, with a, I did a, when I did my PhD I wrote a programme in Lisp, which is 
Has anyone programmed in Lisp? It's an AI language, so it's Lisp stands for lots of ir irritating, silly parentheses. It actually doesn't, but that's how it is like when you're programming in it. So I did a, an agent to teach musical composition to undergrad composers, and it's quite hard work. But ever since then, I've been interested in... I should stay still, shouldn't I? Are you still getting me? Um, um, so you've, this is from The Economist about uh, recently about how jobs usually survive the technological waves. Uh, but will it do this time? So there's a, and there's other articles in The Economist saying AI will, um, will take over lots of jobs, and I'll look into that briefly in a minute, but it's an interesting area. So AI is smart algorithms, fast processors, and large data sets. And our AI is difficult to pin down. Natural language processing used to be an AI problem. Now you get it when you pick up the phone to book the cinema, and facial recognition is on, on Facebook. So, you know, what we used to have this saying, if, it, if, if it's a problem that hasn't been solved, it's AI. If it's been solved, it's computer science. But that's, uh, you know, that's, that's uh, der derogatory. Any, any computer scientists here? Right, so feel insulted. <laughs> no, in fact, I'm a computer. My, I actually was a, com I, my degrees are computer science, so never mind. I'm insulting myself, really. There's no change there. <laughs> so, there was an interesting article on, on perceptions around the world about young people, uh, how they feel they are, are they ready for the automation of the future? It's in The Guardian beginning of this year. And people in India are, very com are fairly confident about their abilities to uh, deal with it, but the people in the UK are way, way down the list and, and parts of Europe about their abilities to deal with the job market as it's emerging, which uh, is quite, I think, quite an interesting insight into how people are feeling about this um, and how, you know, maybe how the training is going in schools and indeed further education and higher education. And uh, that's a whole other topic. You've got Stephen Hawking's um, pr famous professor from the UK uh, talking about AI is gonna could, could, could bring us down. So it's in, there's a podcast, you can go get it. Interesting uh, perspective. So what you, you're getting AIs everywhere. You're getting them in Google cars. You're getting them uh, in uh, Watson. It is the kind of IBM system that beat on Jeopardy, a US game show. It, beat, it won it. So, uh, so it's, and you're getting, I noticed there was a program in the news the Chinese game of Go. Has anyone ever played that? It looks horrendously... It's more, apparently more complicated than the chess. Anyway, a computer beat the European champion, uh, an AI. So, so you're getting it in the news, and, it's, and you're getting, once you get, you're getting the, legal, the legal chiefs talking about if a car... I'm coming for you, I'm Google Car, and uh, I realise I'm going to hit you, and I swerve and hit you instead, a young, a young girl. Who do you sue? You know, so so you get, once you get the legal people involved... You know, you know, because it's because it could it's making decisions through the ranks. It can do automate factories, but it can also do the middle rank uh, jobs. But it's also it could it could it could it's affecting the deci decision making elites because uh, Watson or a version of it from IBM is being used in medicine for diagnosis. It's not helping with proper diagnosis, but it's helping with the actuaries who uh, deal with claims. It's actually qu as good as a human in dealing with what you. So you're getting this threat. So there needs to be a debate about it but it's a complicated area. You had a talk, I think, so you, you, they, you are you all familiar with this? I'm told you had this talk. <laughs> anyway, looking at the labour markets from um, Enrique, uh, uh, the, the drivers of recent job polariz polarisation, and um, <laughs> are you here? Is, are you here? Are you here? Oh, good, right, yeah, uh, name you can pay, pay me later, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you're talking about my PhD student. Excellent. Yeah. Well, you, so what, what did, did you read this report, though? Is this, is, is, he's already graduated, yeah? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, ten years ago. Yeah, okay, so you don't want to read everything he's done since then. No, I no. <laughs> <laughs> You've got other PhD students to worry about, yeah, this lot, yeah. Employment growth remains resilient in high-paid, high-skilled jobs, but I, I, I'm, I think they are being threatened, the, the lawyers and the decision-making elites, but not yet. Uh, and the, where there was net employment growth only in jobs in the top quintile of the wage distribution. So that's a report uh, from uh, insider information. I think um, the, if, if you're interested in, this is where I got the title from, the Pew, the Pew uh, Research Foundation, it's an independent charitable trust in the US, and it's quite usually comes up with pretty good, well-informed uh, uh, articles. 
what, what they're saying, they're looking at AI robotics in the future. They did a survey about over a thousand experts, so it's look at the methodology if you're interested. But they're saying, okay, there's an upside and a downside, and you can read what the upside is. I think we can all say that technology will free us from ev everyday drudger drudgery, um, allow us to express ourselves. You know, that could be dangerous, couldn't it? You know, but you know, ultimately, we as a society are in control of our own destiny. But as I was just saying, yeah, but we need to be, have the language as citizens to dis explore what's being done on our behalf in terms of how the de these systems are designed. Hence, I'm interested in design and talking about design, but I'll get on to that. The downside, which I think is really interesting, is that um, the impacts from automation have thus far on, on the you know, jobs, uh, mostly in blue co blue collar, what they call blue collar workers, uh, coming from a wave of innovation, threatens, it's threatening the kind of white collar workers in the offices, so the middle ranking uh, em employees. High skill works will see, succeed widely, so you, there's an environment where the more skilled you are, the, the, you guys, you're getting PhDs in this area, so you are, you are the highly skilled people uh, that they're talking about, I think, and I am, but that's, that was ages ago. But, um, so you've got, and this, uh, so, but far more may be displaced into lower paying service, so you're going to get the, d the divide going on again, and it's, it's continued, uh, this divide. Our, and what they're saying, which I think is important, our educational system is not adequately preparing us for the future of, of work. So, so that, therefore, that, that, the reason I put that in bold is because I build systems to help people deal with the knowledge, so-called knowledge society, but to engage in, uh, you know, in what I call... Um, uh, this power and control uh, uh, positioning practices. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, so that's all the background. I, f I find, find uh, I think probably there's probably enough people in this room to have a perspective on that, and if you want to raise any issues there, please feel free. So designing, designing, why designing for lifelong learning? So it's taken, it's in the chapter, uh, and along similar lines to the Pew, the Pew report, I propose that much work needs to be done on how to design for, so we can enable people to get the best out of the workplace and as citizens as they trans traverse the so-called smart cities. See the back book chapter for a critical review in this area, but also I look at um, the drivers for lifelong learning and mobiles, museums, and ro my robot. I kind of focus in on those areas, which are good, good areas for li uh, you know, lifelong learning. But in the rest of this talk, I want to look at design opportunities in li lifelong learning. So I, I f as uh, all my career of design, I think I was originally a systems analyst um, working in a programming language called COBOL, which we ha you had punch cards. Yes, I go that far back, co punch cards. And, and anyway, so I've always been a designer of systems. Uh, sometimes, I, but then so I took time out to design music, but, um, you know, <laughs> and design my hairdo, uh, which was hilarious. There's some great pictures on the internet of that. So I want to talk about work-based practice in the EC-funded Learning Les project, which is, okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll say what that is in a minute. The, the research area I lead in the Centre for Moving Images Research is called Hybrid Reality and Culture, and our key research question is here, is in the context of socio-technical systems and environments, how can the design process and design thinking advance or bridge socio-cultural capital? So that's the, 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 the grand question. It's still quite hard. I've, just led into that by saying it's the systems aren't being designed to help people in the workplace. So it's still a big, it's a design stroke research challenge. Um, and these are snapshots from some of the systems I've built in Learning Les and help, uh, you know, to kind of address this. <coughs> in uh, in um, Learning Les, in, in we, we get, we get the, we're allowed to do some theory, which is quite nice, but we, I do design-based research, which comes from out of learning sciences as a, an alternative, but you try to take your theories and go all the way through some methodological approach and have an impact on practice and then feed it back into theory. And that's, a that's kind of a tall order, really, but that's what we do, and it can take some time. But that, that's, so I'm engaging in design-based research. A particular concept I've come up with is uh, the notion of hybrid uh, social learning networks, um, uh, which uh, I get presented last uh, last June in in uh, Romania at the uh, a conference on smart learning environments, uh, Kinshuk and people like that. So it's it's a meta design approach that 
and at the core of it is this notion of hybridity in terms of hybridity, in terms of power and control, uh, and positioning practice, that comes from some cultural historical activity work. H hybridity in terms of online, offline, digital, non-digital, and th there's a lots of other times. So the notion of hybridity interests me. So what you do is we've got this overarching idea and we use it to develop something called, at runtime, you get a zone of possibility where people, uh, people who engage with artifacts like the systems and, and each other uh, are, are involved in this uh, zone, uh, zone of possibility. So you get individuals, groups, digital artifacts, and social positioning practices, this power and control thing going on. And through, and you know, if that's, that's, that's kind of the theory. It's just, I want to allude to it. I don't want to go into it, because what I want to talk about is the systems I've designed and, and where we're trialing them, because I think that's, I'm at the point where I, I did the theory last year because we're in the final year of learning layers. So learning layers, I better say what it is, it's a four-year project in year four now. Uh, uh, we're devising informal uh, learning for SMEs. Uh, we've, we've focused on the construction industry in Germany and the, the health sector in the northeast of England. It's, a got a, it's about 14 million euros spread across the partnership, 27 partners, 11 countries. Uh, it's a bit of a nightmare, actually. Uh, this has been recorded, but, you know, coordinating that and communicating with, S with co people from the NHS, different universities with their research agendas. Co uh, we've got companies who've got their <coughs> exploitation agendas, and <coughs> it's, it's quite um, a range of people, but it's quite exciting. There's some great colleagues there. So what we do is, that in terms of design-based research, we've got... Um, we use this participatory pattern design method. So we look at design patterns. Patterns b briefly come from, originally from architecture, uh, Alexandra, uh, who looks, yeah, you know, there's a house, it's got four rooms, uh, four, four um, windows and a, and a door, that's a pattern. So in computer science, they have patterns, they're very widely understood. And we, in educational design research and design research, we use them to look at what's going on. So we, we so from the theory, I, div I devise some uh, design principles, and then within, by talking to professionals, looking at empirical work, we came up with some patterns, and then we did storyboards, showed them to users in the health service in northeast of England, and came up with this particular approach, which used to develop Confer, which is available, which I'll show you in a minute. This is very quick, just so you know, I do, I have this hard-ass design approach. So I'm going to, I'm going to give the paper on this uh, in. Um, Oh, Ed Media in, in Vancouver this June. It's a tough job, but, but someone's got to do it, okay? <laughs> Actually, they had the good man of Ed Media about five years ago, six years ago, I was in Vancouver, and I, put, I was about to put three papers in because I wanted to go, and they had the good manners to invite me there to give a keynote, so I was very pleased about that. It's always, always good. So it involves lots of talking, lots of logging. We've got a system that was developed uh, called ILDE to log your patterns, the different types of patterns. Uh, and uh, there's lots of, oh, there's always paperwork involved. But this is, we met in Bristol at the beginning of last year and sat down with people, developed them, and we're going to be doing that again with people in higher education to use our tools to, to kind of spin the project tools out. And the good news is, this is like me blowing my own horn, we just had our third review uh, in De uh, December. The commission hires, as you, do you get reviewed, Gabor? Yeah, it always happens. Three, four people, they come along, grill you. It's, it's like a thesis defence, so there's no escaping it no matter where you are in your career. Uh, I, and um, this, this year, luckily, uh, I, where we, I'm lead, I lead Work Package 2, we got praised, uh, you know, we got commended. Uh, so we're, we're only two, two, two out of ten work packages got commended, so I, I am blowing my own horn there. That's a picture, nice picture about what's going on. There are plans, I'm going to skip over that because uh, I want to talk about the tools. So, how am I doing for time? Um, like half an hour. Good. Right then. Any thoughts f so far before I, anyone want to get anything off the chest before I go on to talking about tools? Hmm. Innovation, it's, it's, you mentioned, interesting you mentioned the Romans because there's a great book by the guy who's a technology e editor for The Economist. It's called The, the Writings on the Walls. And he talks about graffiti, about social media has always been there and how they used to, there was graffiti on the walls in Rome. 
and um, how that, and how people used to send pamphlets around to to spread the news. And he's gone through. And I did. A, I remember doing a, a, a paper on coffee houses in the U in uh, England in the in the H. When coffee came over, it was the kind of um, uh, Sufi monks who drank it to keep themselves awake in Ethiopia, I believe. And I got obsessed with researching this, and it's nothing to do with my area really. But I did. So it came over, and then we got the coffee houses in the uh, 1800s in London, where you got the Royal Society retiring to. The, as it was just starting to the coffee houses, they were called the penny universities because Newton and everybody would go there and talk, and you could pay a, a penny for a cup of coffee, and it was like you'd hear this discourse. So what could you could the innovation? This is important to what you, you could go into these coffee houses, slap down a book next to someone you don't know, and say, "What do you think of this book?" And can you imagine doing that in Starbucks or somewhere like that? So you can't. They, I mean, it's changed, but for a time you got people mixing who were the lords and the the lords. There no ladies. Women didn't typically go in because um, coffee was re regarded as a heathen brew. And um, why don't people, why don't Englishmen drink their beer? There was some, some, some quote from the time was saying, you got people who are uh, artisans, you got people who are engineers, all mixing to do, and that was the start of both a revolution in the industry, industrial revolution in the UK, England. You also got the kind of uh, the reformation happening, uh, not the reformation, the enlightenment process happening where there was a kind of there. So lots of innovation came from that social socialization, which I think innovation, I think there's lots of problems with that word innovation, but depending on if, if you reframe it, you can see it happening throughout history. And I think there's an opportunity with what we've got now with the social media to innovate and cut across the layers like you did in the coffee houses in London. Uh, um, but I don't know if that really answers your question. It just allow me to tell a few stories. What, what did you have in mind? I think there was an article, and I don't know the source in the Economist, which was saying, in fact, there won't people will have more leisure time because there won't be jobs for most pe a lot of people, and that's quite. I think that's quite dangerous, given we've turned into a kind of a consumer society, and in and China's turning into a consumer society. And so, where's this, if there's if there's a creative side to people or a spiritual side, that's become, in my humble opinion, a bit kind of marginalised. So, I think these machines will. Uh, I mean, the uh, University of Southampton, they talk about social machines. Uh, that's Tim Berners-Lee has said, we need to realize the full potential of the internet by building machines that work in partnership. And we, we're trying to do that because we work with GLATS and recommender systems and we're trying to do that. But it's hard to do it in a way that's socially acceptable. So, uh, but I, I, I think, so what you're gonna get is the kind of the smart algorithms being used and the, the AIs increasingly. They already are, I mean, it's, it's already happened. So I think there will, there will be less. I fear there will be less and less jobs uh, for people both going through the ranks. Even, even as I say, the kind of um, decision-making elites like doctors and lawyers uh, will be challenged. And that once they, because they've already started squeaking, you know. So uh, once they start squeaking, then you know there's something going on because you know they they can see what's coming. I haven't sat down and uh, analysed it in great detail though. I tried to show you some links, but but I leave that to you guys to do to do the solid work on that. <laughs> Well, we've, we've already got the seeds of it in social media. People spent hours on lifelong learning. You got the Livingston's report from Canada, uh, the Nell report, saying people spend hours and hours on their private projects. So I think people do do that, whether it be DIY or, or something for the community. Uh, you know, so I think that the, that the seeds of all the technology has allowed that, and that's what we, like, we regard as informal learning. Uh, 
uh, which is another contested term, but, and that's part of lifelong learning. So I think, um, I think that is going on. Um, but how those people are supported through, if, you know, in ter if there's another austerity drive is, is, is a question. Uh, okay, good. That was a, we, so we get on to the tools that may help people in the, in the workplace. So I'm going to give you a quick, uh, so I've given you a quick introduction to learning layers and, th and some tools we've been looking at. And uh, if, if you have any ideas, we're looking, I'm looking for ideas of how to use these tools. We are using them in the various areas, so I'm looking for some input as well. If, you, if you, something occurs to you, you know, just sort of um, jump in. So I've mentioned co-design, that's quite a difficult practice. These, although the partnership is quite large, who we've been working with in particular in Learning Layers to do our uh, kind of work is uh, University of Leeds, because they've got links, it's the Leeds Institute of Medical Education. Uh, I should have put the NHS there, one of they're one of the partners we work with. I must change that. Uh, Ray Comer, a developer from the, from the Netherlands. Technical University of Graz, they developed the, what's called the social semantic server and uh, related recommender systems. We work with University of, of um, Innsbruck and Tallinn. So they're our main people we, we kind of work with to do, to do this kind of elaborate co-design. Co-design um, means you take your ideas and talk to the people you're developing the systems for and it takes quite a while really. But th so that's what we've done in particular with Confer and um, this system called the Zop app came from something that's been co-designed so over the last few years. Talking about not getting bored. Okay, so the first project is, is something to do with high... So if you've ever come to Bristol, go... Have you heard of Banksy, the graffiti artist? All right, so he's from there, Stokes Croft. Uh, you, nobody knows who he is, but yes, some, a lot of people do, actually. So he's from here. So Stokes Croft's an area of uh, Bristol that's completely covered in amazing graffiti. There's lots of uh, cultural uh, and political activists based there, or claiming to be based there, or is surrounded by areas of, for homeless people. Salvation Army do somewhere for homeless. They sometimes congregate in the middle. There's lots of, it's, a, it's kind of lots going on, cafes springing up. Uh, it's ripe for gentrification. In fact, it's, people are already moving in, and it happened when I lived in Camden Town in the early 80s, except, so they block off streets and do art, whereas we blocked off streets and play music, because that's what we did in the 80s. We were into music. Uh, but music like Massive Attacker from this uh, neck of the woods and people like that. So, so this is some, one of the graffiti. So what they've done is someone called um, People's Republic of Stokescroft uh, have, have built um, an alternative world of art that's, that challenges the more traditional approaches in Bristol because we're very good at the creative industries and art. So it's become quite worldwide famous for their festivals. But he set up some um, workshops that sell pottery and there's a print workshop. So they've kind of built themselves up from the bottom and he's quite, uh, we went to see him, me and my colleague Rick Lander, who I'm working with on this. So we want to capture those stories. Uh, and we want to get people to capture them who are in the, from the community and then put them on the web and get people discussing them from around the world, from Bradford to, to Greece, as a form of bottom-up social regeneration. So that's something that, you know, as, as um, in answer to you, says, to stop people getting bored, come on, you know, if I can, um, so we're doing a uh, proof of concepts, then we're going to bid for money to, to bring this around. But so it's part of learning layers in the, con in the sense that it's SMEs pop up, you get pop-up shops and the SMEs are the print workshops or the pottery workshops from, from that area. So that's what we, we're trying to get vignettes and get people seeing how to do it, but people telling it in their own, own you know, using their mobile phones, going around making videos t of how they did it. And so that's hybrid Stokes Croft. There's the vision. Uh, so you get these community, it's a digital public space, which is a, a term coined by people from the BBC. <coughs> we do lots, we work with lots of people at, uh, br at our university. We run courses for the BBC on wildlife film production because there's a, in Bristol, there's a, there's a BBC kind of uh, film unit, uh, centre. So we're looking at Stokes Croft to do this kind of inner city neighbourhood regeneration and the hybrid Stokes Croft will give website, will give, it'll be a responsive website, give these stories and insights to people uh, and it's how people can consume in media, com comment on it and develop their own arguments and propose ideas. 
So, um, but it's when you go into these places, people have got, because they're a community-based projects, A, they need money to do things if you're suggesting things, but also they're quite cautious and slow in the way they work because they're very political and they have, in the past, had lots of arguments. So you've got to be cautious how you go in. So this is taking some time, but we're getting a proof of concept together for, um, for, for you know, we're working on it. It's, it's been filmed. In learning layers, we've got something called Achso, um, which was developed to be used in the construction industry. So you take your mobile phone onto a training site, you point it and make a short film using Achso, which is in Play Store. You then tag it with uh, you at certain points with if something's good going on or something is a problem, you can stop, pause it there, tap on the screen to make a, a little circle, say this is the point of interest, then you annotate it, it tags it for you, but you can add tags and then you can uh, upload it to the cloud and share it with a group of people and discuss it. So this is being used in the construction industry in northern Germany, developed through by colleagues in, I have to give them the name check, here we go, Alto University, um, there we go, in, in Helsinki. So that's kind of, so we, if you, we've taken the cord, we've done what's called, there's some computer scientists, so we've taken it from GitHub, we've taken the, f the, f the code, we've done a fork in the code, and we've developed something called the Zop app, Zone of Possibility app as a generic approach, and we're going to use it in the UK uh, because um, so for, um, for for different areas. First of all, so this is what it looks like anyway. So we've, we've I've got a PhD student from computer science who's on a bursary. He's just got his PhD uh, doing this for me. So so you here. This means it's oh I can point. That's been uploaded to the cloud. That, mean it ha that means it hasn't. So that's just a test. We've only been doing it for a, a, mo uh, a month or so. So, so we've got it in lo sort of on our local servers. What it's got behind it is something called. Um, uh, it's got a sort of. Um, it's got access to the social semantic server. So people are going along. They can capture videos, play them, annotate them, see the videos, tag them, upload them, and discuss them with friends. Uh, but at the moment, we're testing the app, the modified app, um, for this kind of group sharing. So we've got to get that, we're getting that together. Uh, but we, um, it, it, the back end is in Ruby Rails. Uh, it's, it's, it's cool. And that allows us to work with the recommender system. So when you go to Amazon, it says someone bought this book. You bought, you're buying this book or record, CD. Uh, other people have looked at these things. They're based on smart algorithms. So there's about... And these, there's, so Technical University of Graz have got hundreds of these algorithms, and some of them are good in some circumstances, some are not good in uh, others. But once people start tagging and annotating, and you've got context from the shot of where they were and things like that, who they're talking to, you can then use that information uh, you, for collaborative filtering to make recommendations. But we've, this is something we were meant to do in learning layers, and we're still trying to do it. I mean, some people use these algorithms, but to use them in a context like Stokes Croft or with, with people in the NHS, you've got to be very careful. So it's taken some time to get that technology used. So by bringing the technology to the UK, I can gra I've got some people and we're going to work on making, testing which recommenders work in which circumstances. So not only can you do something quite nice with the app, <coughs> you can, we're looking at how to make the algorithms work for us. So where we're going to use it at first, in, the, um, in Bristol last September we ran something called uh, the International Fil uh, Festival of Cinematography. So they're people who make films, the actual big wigs behind the camera and my colleague in my research centre, he's mates with the people who've filmed Gandhi and Aliens and things like that. So they come and they had a great festival, so we, we're going to, in 2016, we're going to take the Zop app and we're going to change it into... Um, uh, the, a Cinefest app, so people, students can go around, people are learning film to make films, they can do these, take these clips of what they think's good, what they think's bad, talk to their mates, friends, co-learners about it, tag it, and then also we're going to get the actual experts to do something similar, so they can show examples of good practice. So we're going to use it as an example there for professional development of, of, of different levels. I've just shown this yesterday, the day before, yeah, yesterday, to a guy who's in charge of transformations f for Bristol. He does digital transformations, and <coughs> he sees a lot of use for this. Uh, so we're going to be, and I'm sure if you if you can think of any uses, let me know. Um, but still got 15 minutes. Yep. Yeah, right. So this is the one that's I've gone from our early ideas to the one that's we spent the whole we've spent about 13, 14 months on this. <coughs> this system's called Confer. 
Um, if you want, when you download the slides, you can do it, get a small, it's a silent demo of it, but it shows you what you can do. So this is a system that um, <coughs> gives you three steps to consensus. It takes you, it's based on a pedagogical model of progressive inquiry, and it scaffolds you uh, as you're going through them to support uh, work, work groups for everyone. It's based on co-design in the NHS in the northeast of England with GP practices. And it helps you make, so what they do is they found that someone, they'd have an issue like, uh, my people are coming in without passports, how do you deal with that in the GP practice? So they'd set up a working group, but what happened is they'd start, they'd meet, then <coughs> go away, send emails, the emails get lost, the, the kind of flow gets lost of what they're trying to do, so it kind of, we've built a tool to bridge between meetings face to face to deal with a working group. And it, so it helps you structure the tasks, supports decision and discussions. Using these three steps, what do we need? What do we know? Um, um, what uh, do we do? And it's based on a, a, a kind of a Finnish academic. It's based on knowledge building approaches from Scala Malia and Beretta. So it's based on a pedagogical model. And that, and in fact, that, that diagram is the model, except we've simplified it. Because we had it, we started off uh, in computer science software development. We, we have this principle called KISS. It's called keep it simple, stupid. And the stupid's me, the developer, the designer. So, so we, we, we really did simplify it. And it always works, yeah, oh yeah, we've got that principle, haven't we? Yeah, we sh I should have remembered. <coughs> so, typically, it's on practice demand, problem solving, brainstorming, those types of things. <coughs> it's, it kind of bridges between meetings, it allows you to support the discussions, it scaffolds what you're doing, it allows you get, for each group, working group, you have an email, you can, and people who are from the wider uh, practice, can email in ideas and you can promote them to the brainstorming. So people who are outside can be involved. So you're getting the positioning, the power and control, because people outside, outside will say, we well, came up with this recommendation, but <coughs> I don't agree with that. I didn't have any input. So that allows people to email things in. You can squirt out a report at any time. Within all these um, phases, the, uh, oh, on there, boy. You can have mini discussions all the way through, but they don't get put in the report, they're private. So you get this dialogue going on. Nobody can say this is the answer. It's your, the drop-down menus say this is a suggestion, a, a comment. You're trying to stop people taking over as much as you can. It's not always possible. But that's the positioning practices I was m talking about. Um, so each stage, you, you start with what do we need to do? These are from progressive inquiry model. You set the context, what, you know, <coughs> what is the area we're looking at? We're setting up a, uh, in the example I gave you, we're trying to deal with people who are coming into the practice without passports. Or it, it, it can be used by student, uh, students who are doing a piece of work. Um, we're working with HE now. They're going to go out and um, uh, they're going to set up an event f for their coursework or something like that. You, just, you say what the questions are and then you move on to brainstorming uh, and identifying the issues. Uh, so brainstorming, you can take things that are coming in, you can, uh, let's see what we've got. No, don't go, don't, don't go into detail. Uh, you can, um, th an important, let me take a talk about this feature, because we, have I got 15, 10 minutes in total left? Or I'm going to end soon, because I want to see if there's any questions. But here, in options, you've, you come up with your solutions, you, your conclusions, and you say in which circumstances they apply, because people, when they do, uh, I'm taking it you've all done brainstorming. And if you, you have, you invest, if you suggest something, you've, you're invest, you've invested something in it and you don't want to let go, I'm the same. So what we do is we say, when is it useful? <coughs> Here. And then, but you say, well, look, this is what we're trying to do. So at least your, if your recommendation, your option doesn't get used, you get the circumstances when it could be used. So you know you could always come back and use that later for something else. But you then make your recommendation and you can, you can, uh, output a, a report that shows where you've got to in your working group's deliberations uh, and it um, doesn't include the, question, the discussions. And you can always, in the dis you can always see who, the history of what's been done. If somebody deletes something, then you can see what's been done. So, and this is a prototype, but we've co-designed it with the uh, GP practices and the NHS. It's being used by, it's going to be trialled by lots of people, but like the Health Education England, which is a national body in the UK. And the NHS are quite... <coughs> difficult to work with, they're quite slow, a bit like the police, because they're scrutinised massively. 
and there's a reason why they're kind of all, they're very cautious. So this is quite um, a good a good idea. I, I'm showing it to staff in higher education. <coughs> we've shown it to people in museums. They see the use of it as well. So this is one of the other tools we've got that are interesting. If you do, you, does anyone see any possibilities for using this in your area? What, how how would you imagine using it? There'd have been time. I can because I can I can email my colleague and she can set you up with a, a group to do it. But you need a bit of time to to, to play. But perfect example though. Yeah. So it, it, it does in, it does because it's a progressive inquiry model for coming down to a, it's based on how what we do in research. So this is perfect for this kind of thing. So I think it's going to have a lot of application. So if you're interested, I will. Uh, well, you've all got. You can email me and I'll set you up with an account. So I'll, I'll be happy to do that for anybody who wants to play with it and for. You could take what you do this afternoon and maybe then, that's the face-to-face -face meeting. You all come up with it, but then you move to this to keep, to bridge, you're not going to meet each other, are you? So if, if you're interested, I will, we'll provide some, have a think about it. Go look at the demo thing here, if you get time. See, um, oh, if you go there, there's lots of training videos you can look at uh, on the, there, that link. But this link, that link there, it's got a f like it's about three minutes. It'll take you through what it does and have a think about it. But do I mean, even if you don't want to use it, get back with some comments, and that would be very valuable. Anybody, I invite any, anybody to, to to do that, and, and also with the uh, the Zop app. Have, have you mentioned that you're testing most of these tools? We're gonna we're evaluating it from March. Effectiveness, as you know, is a loaded word, but they're doing it from a stakeholder perspective, and Innsbruck are leading on a full-on evaluation for for the, yeah yeah we're in. Uh, uh, I'm going to Innsbruck next week to double check, but yeah, they've got um, they've got m um, basic indicators they've come up with through stakeholder engagement, uh, and they don't really refer back to the theory, but that's you know they in fact they refer to Innsbruck's theories on uh, on information systems, but that's fine because they at least they they're, they're going to be very uh, rigorous. With yeah, the 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 um, Jane Massey, do you ever come across? She's come a very uh, scrutinised it. She's very good at evaluation scrutinized our plan. I'm going to... So luckily I'm on the conclusion. So I think design affects all our lives. Think of the Apple uh, iPhone, what a wonderful design that, that was. They were typically British and German designers. Uh, I, I had to say that, but, uh, but um, the iPhone is a great design. Even when I was living in Muswell Hill in London, lots of lovies, actors, resting actors, even they could use it. So that's how good that design was. It's a bit like, I think um, design's quite important, architecture everywhere, design's crucial. It's a democratic right to have equity of access to cultural resources in terms of lifelong learning. I think if we, do, if we exclude people as the job market changes, we, there's, people will be doing different things and maybe they could come into the dog, dog, dog market job market uh, if they if they get access to the right resources job opportunities I mean cultural resources in a very wide sense uh, health opportunities you know and so on and so forth uh, we've looked I've looked at how design approaches have uh, impacted on uh, the EC project of learning layers we've used it quite consistently uh, and been praised by the Commission for our approach um, We've evol uh, evolved our design process and thinking so on to uncover new possibilities. I think that's the great thing about design. You can you dig into it with this design-based research approach and you uncover things that uh, you didn't realise you could do, uh, you know, um, uh, to enable these social technical systems to bridge and build the cultural capacity and the social um, uh, sort of capacity of our citizens to transform lives and bring about... The f the, as uh, Tim Berners-Lee -Lee says, if we use these social machines, these are what we're building here, because Facebook's a social machine, to bring about the uh, p full potential of the internet. So um, there's some more information. There's some key references. And any questions? Thank you. Thank you.